The TFCC Podcast, brought to you by Bespoke Cricket, Rutland's premium cricket brand. For the best bats, pads and gloves, check out bespoke-cricket.co.uk. Here's what's coming up on the podcast. I met um, uh, Tom Flowers out in uh, Uppingham Way today. He's like saying this is a new feel around Leicestershire. I I have a real philosophy with coaching, which is if you're going to practice, practice properly. I had a difficult conversation to have. If I can go, I've tried to make them realise why it's important, who it's important for, and what the knock-on effects of that are, then I've done my job as a coach. Now, on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the TFCC podcast, The Life of a Cricket Coach. With me, Tom Flowers, ECB Level 4 coach and uh, director of the TFCC Group Limited. Guys, we've got a interesting episode ahead today for you all. So we hope you enjoyed the first episode, received some great feedback on that, taken on board, uh, lots of positives, uh, also some areas we, we can look at. Um, in relation to the first podcast. So we're looking forward to hopefully uh, bettering the offering and as we go forward, continuing the engagement with the local cricket cricket coaching community and those wider afield that also tuned into our first episode. What's on the horizon today? A little update for you all from a uh, meeting that I had this week. Um, That was with the Leicestershire Chief Executive, Sean Jarvis. I'm looking forward to um, feeding back to you guys how that went what happened and give you a bit of an insight into um, what's what's going on there with our relationship. Um, I want to give you Tom's top tip of the week. So that's going to be a new feature we've got for you. So a new uh, feature will be the top coaching tip of the week for you guys. I want to look at some things around honesty and, and vulnerability of players and, and why that's crucial. Um, and then I want to give you a main takeaway of the week. So my biggest sort of learning, learning of the week. So I think that's how I want to format today. Um, we're doing it from our offices today um, in Bilsden. There is uh, a little bit of um, coming and going and next door because we're next to the post office. So um, the only background interference, do apologise about that in advance. Guys, I've actually been away for a week. So for the first time in a long time, I've managed to get away in May, which sounds pretty strange for a cricket coach, but if you can imagine that we, a lot of our planning starts really head on from the start of January, um, and obviously this year we've had the the cricket centre as well over in Rutland to to manage and to make sure that we, you know, I mean we saw over a thousand five hundred people during during the opening this year, um, and that's that was just different people, so um, not repeat customers included in that, and it, it was it's been pretty chaotic actually from January onwards and pretty much foot to the floor for five months so took a week away gathered my thoughts got got cleared my head and I think that <clears throat> give you a bit of insight into me and as a coach and as well as a person really I'm, I'm very much I've been identified in the past as a bit of an all or nothing person and I can very much see how people have come to that conclusion and I've come to that conclusion myself um, I'll give you an example um, I've always struggled with my weight and um, I, one of the main reasons being that when I am training, I am committed to training, doing it properly, flat out. Um, and when I'm not, I'm the opposite, eating as much as I can, feeling sorry for myself and not going to the gym. And I think that um, this all or nothing trait, I guess the first thing is I'm, I'm aware of it, but it's something that... Um, used positively has a real uh, benefit. You know, I, I've, I never struggle to meet deadlines. I can always push through and um, give everything to to every job, every person, every player. But I think that it does take its toll on me, particularly mentally. And one of the coping strategies I've got, having an increased self awareness of it, is that I've developed coping mechanisms. Let's say to deal with that. So now I, I know that. If I don't take regular breaks and actually not feeling guilty about these breaks as well. So my brother made a comment, oh, you're always on holiday, mate. And it was tongue in cheek. But actually, um, that hit me quite hard. And I sort of thought, yeah, that might be how this is perceived. And I had to say to myself, well, that might be the perception from the outside. But living inside my head and the way, you know, my guys... uh, in the business I always say you go 100 miles an hour my brain goes 100 miles an hour the other night I got out of bed to write something down at quarter to 12 and my other half says what are you doing and she's right 
But one of the coping mechanisms I have is that if you're going to live your life that way and be flat out as a, as a person or as a, as a coach individual, you've got to have coping mechanisms. So recently I've been going to the gym more, trying to eat better, um, lost a bit of weight, which is great. And I'm going to hopefully continue that. And as I say, the holiday um, just, you just presses the reset button and actually you do some of the, your clearest thinking, I think. And you, you're saying you can't see the wood through the trees. I think when you're away like that, you, you as a business owner, you never stop working, I don't think. you, you got ideas in your head and you you know there's something going on back home. You need to check in, you need to forward something. So I don't think you ever truly have a break. But it was just a reset push. And I think that seeing the wood through the trees um, started to happen while I was away and when I got back. So a bit of an update, guys. Met with Sean Jarvis this week, Leicestershire's County Cricket Club CEO. Real, real positive meeting. Now, for those who don't know, Sean is a Leicester guy through and through. Moved north um, for a long while and worked at Huddersfield Town Football Club. He's he's a real man of the people. You know, I, you meet him and you just think, yeah, I can get on with this guy. I could have a pint with him. I could have a coffee with him. He's a real good guy. And with that. There was a real candid and honest conversation that happened. We we spoke about um, Leicestershire over the last sort of, 12, 15 years, the journey they've gone through, the transitions that they've made. We spoke about the current performances, um, current signings, and I was very honest in the way we spoke and how I indicated that we feel that we could do more to help, help Leicestershire um, and develop and he in agreement probably felt that the club could also do more to to help engage uh, with us and and together hopefully create more of a difference. I met um, uh, Tom Flowers out in uh, Uppingham Way today he's like saying this is a new feel around Leicestershire the connections that we're creating with the clubs out there. Um, so that's a real positive and, and like I said to him you know it's when I left Leicester at 21, it took a number of years, I think, for me to rediscover, you know, becoming a fan of Leicestershire cricket and for reasons I might touch on in the future. But um, it's obviously a complete change down there in personnel and with, with you know, Nico's at the helm, Claude Henderson, very good guy, good people at the top of the club. So I just urge everyone that that's a fan of Leicestershire at the moment that's listening to this, please remain positive, um, stay optimistic. It isn't easy, I don't think, for the club with the constraints that are put on the club. But one thing me and Sean both agreed on was that the club are, are making small wins and it doesn't have to be um, necessarily huge uh, expenditure. But one thing we both agreed on um, was that previously we thought that the small wins weren't happening. And I'm talking about the things that don't cost money. So that's just a thought for you guys and I'll leave that with you. Okay, uh, next thing, new feature you want to add on the podcast, Tom's top tip. So, from a coaching perspective, and what I want to look at this week is how you run your net sessions. Now, the classic club net session is, uh, well, after the three or four of the guys have been playing football against the net, I should think, for 10 minutes, and one of them rocks up late, and the senior pro decides as and when he's going to bat and who's going to bowl at him. And once you get through all that sort of ball, what I suggest is, is that, I have a real philosophy with coaching, which is if you're going to practice, practice properly. And my playing days was very much that. And I had to take that approach and, and maximise um, the potential that I had. And one thing I've always tried to install into the sides I've worked with is you know, let's practice properly, guys. You know, if we're going to do this, we're going to be here. And, and the way I pitch it is if you're going to be here for an hour and a half, two hours a week, we do it and we practice properly. Um Otherwise, what's the point? You've wasted two hours. And as soon as you turn that on its head with the guys and they get to think of it from a different perspective or through a different lens, it's amazing the response that you get. And you keep coming back to that point. Look, guys, you're turned up, so you're indicating, you're voting with your feet that you want to be here. Why not? Let's do it properly. And there, is re there isn't really a comeback you can have to that. Because if the classic, oh, no, no, not bother, don't want to take it too seriously, well, you're here. So why, why are you at training anyway? So... That's the first point. Uh, ne the next session variation I want to give you is a very, very simple one that I use, I have up my sleeve, and I really think it's valuable, which is called a decision-making net. So, the Ron Seal job, you know, what does what it says on the tin, but 
providing that it's pitched correctly, this can be done by you know your captain or your, your senior player. And at the start of the net, I'd simply say, right, guys, you know, more focused net today. Because we, we see the classic batters, they go in, they finish 40 for five off their 10 minutes, you know, hit four big shots out the net, which they've then rolled the sleeves up, flexed the biceps. As a result, the bowlers are banging it halfway down because they don't want to get hit out of the net. And it just becomes a, a complete beat show. So from my side, um, this works very simply. You get the guys in at the start. You say, look, these are the rules. If you play and miss, you change ends. So it works as a paired exercise, which also can help ease numbers in nets as well. You know, Again, poor net practice, one guy batting, seven guys queuing up to bowl. Why not have two batting? Okay, two can be waiting, doing the drill on the outside, four bowlers or whatever, three bowlers. So, I mean, you can really make it, very small changes can make your club net sessions a lot, lot better. And the, how it works is if, going back to the, the drill, so if you play a miss, you change ends. If you get out, you change ends. And when I say get out, if you chip it up to the ring fielder, you know, head hot, you're out. And it needs discipline, you know, automatic court behind, slips are in place. And if the ball hits you on the pad, and what, what the reason I ask for that one is because it gets players to go with their bat first early on, and especially against the spinners, that's a really good drill. But also off the seamers, when the ball is slightly straighter, you know, when you're playing well, you've got to really wait for that ball. So guys that get wrapped on the pads often is because they're throwing their hands early when the ball's sort of in the hip area. So it's a good drill. Now the consequence for the bowlers is that if they bowl a wide or a leg side wide, um, you know, that then the batters don't have to change ends. Um, so a leg side wide, um, obviously, if they batter tries to play and misses it, they're not changing ends. And an off side wide, obviously, who'd hope batters would leave. Um, but that's simply how it works. And the idea, the way I pitch this is, is that, you know, this is completely relevant to a game. You put huge focus on the first 12 balls of the of the net. And you just say, look, you know, my my aim with this would be to not let my, my partner be facing any balls. I'm going to face all the balls. And... It also teaches the, the not only the batter to prize their wicket and, and to think from ball one about about crumbs, I've got to get on the ball here, but also the partner who might not be facing many balls, they've got to learn to switch on and off. So again, it's another skill you're tapping into. So that is net session variations. I do hope that's a useful tip for the week. Okay, so um, honesty and vulnerability I've got here written down uh, as a player, but as a coach as well. So... I guess where I'm coming from with this is is that as a business here, we have a huge emphasis on our culture. And it's not cheesy. It is just values, really. So you could call it values or culture. I don't really mind. And one of those is trust. And I do think that trust is built on the foundations of a number of things. Clear communication, supportive practice, so supporting each other, um, a respect for each other and an ability to have honest conversations and that is huge and I do think that I want to share something that happened at work this week so um, it was actually with a colleague so one of the guys that works for me and I I had a difficult conversation to have and I my initial reaction sort of the red flag syndrome um, and, and the red driver of me which is sort of a, for those who don't know is a personality type you know sort of very forthright and a defense mechanism and I wanted to fire out straight away I actually used my breakaway to contemplate how I was going to approach this conversation and um, what I was going to say I didn't fire in I slept on it the old adage um, and the situation I think was was then I was able to convey my main points a lot clearer, and I think where that relates to a coach is that the idea of uh, giving player most feedback we see from coaches often is what we call hot feedback. So it's there and then in the moment, emotions are high. Now look, if it's a small tweak to a technique, a practice session, fair enough, but. You know, the, the Neil Warnock sit in a circle, lads, on your Saturday night and get a dressing down. Look, which I've been guilty of a couple of times. People listening to this will probably have been involved with that. I, I now know that, that that at that stage, most of the guys with reasonable cricketers, they know what they've done wrong or what they need to improve. And I just think the idea of moving away, if you can as a coach, especially on game day from a hot feedback um, model and actually going, you know what? Let's sleep on it, guys. Let's revisit this on Wednesday night or Tuesday night, whatever night you train. And just let the dust settle and let the guys 
have some reflection time because let's be honest as, as a coach I certainly believe and I'm sure those coaches listening in that learning only really happens with with reflection um, and if we're not giving the players that time to reflect then are we being true to our our coaching values and and there's just a thought for you so that's my thing about thoughts about feedback and being honest now what I would say is is that the honesty side of things so coming back to this uh, conversation with a colleague I was um, I thought to myself before the conversation I thought I'm going to be dead straight here okay we're not going to beat around the bush no ambiguity I'm going to set out exactly my perspective here how I'm seeing things and where I see it um, with the following reasons why and to be able to to explain them reasons in such a way that um, the way I pitched it, I think promoted um, a different thought pattern from, from him. And it stems down to the fact that I was honest from the outset. This is what I'm, I'm not particularly happy with at the moment. These are the reasons why, okay? This is the evidence. And this is what I need from you. And I think that very simple model, it, it cuts out the ambiguity. He knew where he stood. I knew where I stood. And we know um, a clear path moving forward. And there's a reference point there because we've had the conversation. Um, and I think I think he probably agreed with the majority of my points. I also think that he um, gave me a couple of points that I've got to go away and go actually maybe I'm seeing that from a different perspective now so I think that's a healthy honest um, working relationship and I think that can be done with you know in coaching teams but with players and coaches as well there's nothing worse than saying what you think the player wants to hear and I think that uh, look I don't mean brutal honesty there's a way of doing it you can be tactile you can be very you know smart in the way you deliver feedback but and, and look, sometimes that you have to be brutal with your honesty if, if there's, a, there's something that... But I do think that there's a time and a place for that. And all I, what I'd say is is pick your moment, pick your setting, um, consider the context of where they're at. So where they're at in their day, their week, their cycle or their personal life and leave any important conversation with coach or player like that. Leave it on good terms, leave it with clarity and leave it with cards on the table because otherwise you're just going to revisit, revisit, okay? That's my view on honesty and vulnerability as a player. So finally, guys, for today, I just want to talk to you about emotional responses as a coach. So I've recently been on the first few parts of my ECB Elite Mentoring course, which to give you a quick outline, uh, obviously I've done my level three and four now, um, been level four, uh, for qualified coach over a year and I've had the opportunity to enroll on a mentors course which you know what from from six and a half years you know, in, in, in business now um, and also being an elite coach and having worked in different environments the the USP that I felt I could bring to that role as a mentor which is something we're doing every day I've done it with players I've done it with colleagues I've done it with all sorts of people you know, I, th I think it happens in relationships, in families. You know, I've, I've, my, my family have mentored me through through things and vice versa, I think. So um, it's a really good fit for me, I think. And, and, and it's, a, it's another opportunity to learn. And one of the big, and this is my takeaway of the week for, for you guys, is that, and it kind of links into the last thing really, is about standards, I guess. It's about your own expectations, your own standards. And a lot of it comes from your initial reaction, which often is that emotive emotional response and i'll give you an example okay a guy turns up late to practice okay my initial emotional response with that as a coach is why the beep are you late it's not beep good enough if if 13 of the blokes can get here why can't you uh, when you have got here you're just sauntering over making no real effort your energy levels are poor etc etc okay that's my initial emotional response now, and that would be, that's carbon type, that is how I would react to that. And so how, how I would be thinking about it in my head. And you sort of see these films where, you know, it's a fast forward, isn't it? So you, you visualize what might unfold if you, if that did happen. And quite often, if that was said, two reactions, you're going to get the initial um, fighting back. So, you know, they're going to, they're going to respond with 
um, equally an emotional um, reply that's probably not really thought through and, and maybe sort of fight or flight, if you like, say fighting back or, or they might just take the flight option, which is, you know, off and, 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 and leave and you've lost, a, you've lost a player who might have been able to add to that session. So I think something I've, I've learned from dealing with initial emotive, emotional responses that, that I have as a coach is just to take a step back and go, okay, and, and actually, I look at this now and how my mum, my traits my mother has, and, and very, very similar. And I often say to her, oh, you know, you're always seeing things from other perspectives and, you, you know, uh, you, you're almost too, too balanced in your judgments. But actually, there is some mileage to it. So now I'll say, in my head, I'll think, OK, um, is me blowing up here going to help the session? Probably not. Is me blowing up here in front of the rest of the group going to do any benefit for them as well who were all here on time who are wanting to you know halfway through something no it's not it's interrupting them it's stopping the flow of the session is it going to add positiveness or positive energy to the session most likely not uh could this result in um something bigger than it than it, than it actually currently is yes probably okay is there a better way to deal with this than shouting over something a causing embarrassment B, being slightly provocative, which I know I've done in the past. I'd actually now approach it and go, you know what? There's a better way to this. And I'll probably pull that player aside. And it might well be five minutes after, um, once the drill started or as they're getting ready, whatever. And say, look, hey, mate, come over and just say, look, it's really important that you, you, you do try your best to be here on time. I know you've got work and sort of, I think that's the softener, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, we're all late and I often say, you know, I was late to this or, so you're putting it on a level, you're not making it all about them, you're saying, look, I relate to this, I've, I've too have been late, so I've been in your position, however, if I am running late like that, okay, that, that's one thing, fine, but you've got to then get yourself up and, up and at them, you know, as soon as possible and make them realise that their actions, so by you being late and then, um, taking ages to get your boots on and you get to get over to the session and coming over and and uh, not being on the ball, it has a real knock-on effect for the rest of the guys. And I think f- even if the guy that's that is late in that situation, whether it's a match day or practice, isn't bothered themselves, I think it's very hard for them to to act like they're not bothered that it's affecting other people. So that's my sort of key takeaway for the week. Question your initial reaction. Is there a better way of dealing with it? What is the end goal that you want? So actually out of that, I just want them to get there on time. And you know what? They may never do that. But actually, if I can go, I've tried to make them realise why it's important, who it's important for, and what the knock-on effects of that are, then I've done my job as a coach. Guys, really hope you've enjoyed today's second episode. As ever... Please send in any comments. Please um, give us some feedback. We do want to keep these podcasts um, a regular thing. Um, We like to get them out there on Mondays, if we can do. So it'll be, as I say, between anywhere between 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes. You know, there's no... There's no sort of blueprint for this for us. It's depending on, on what content we want to go through, how much engagement we're getting, and and what our experiences are of that particular week. So, guys, thanks once again for joining in the TFCC podcast, Life for Cricket Coach. I'm Tom Flowers. Hope you've enjoyed today. Have a great week and go well. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to leave us a review and follow us so you never miss an episode.